The key idea of Mobile Brick is it is a multi-view RGBD dataset captured using a mobile device, which includes a high precise ground truth uh, shapes for a set of uh, very diverse set of 3D shapes. Welcome to Talking Papers, the podcast where we talk about papers and let the papers do the talking. We host early career academics and PhD students to share their cutting edge research in computer vision, machine learning, and everything in between. I'm your host, Itzik Ben Shabbat, a researcher by day and podcaster by night. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Talking Papers, the podcast where we talk about papers and let the papers do the talking. Today, we will be talking about the paper Mobile Brick, Building Lego for 3D Reconstruction on Mobile Devices. This paper was accepted to CVPR 2023, and I'm happy to host the first author of the paper, KG Lee. Hello, KG, and welcome to the podcast. Can you introduce yourself? Hello. Yep. Hello, everyone. This is KG. Uh, my name is KG Lee. And so the paper I'm going to talk about today is called Mobile Brick, Building Lego for 3D uh, reconstruction on mobile devices. This uh, is a work I did uh, when I was doing my postdoc in Oxford, uh, collaborated with uh, Jawan, uh, Robert from Apple, and uh, Philip Tor and, and Victor Picasso. They are my supervisor uh, at Oxford. Great. Yeah. So let's. Since you already covered the author section of the paper, let's move to the kind of an abstract TLDR kind of format in two or three sentences. What is this paper about? Yeah, so this paper is a data set paper, as the title suggested. So uh, it is about building, uh, using Lego to build an RGBD data set to, uh, for, for 3D object eva uh, reconstruction evaluation. Right. So, uh, the key challenge in like uh, evaluating 3D reconstruction is getting reliable, uh, ground truth annotation, right? So there are a few, uh, data sets already existing, uh, to do this task. Like, one of them is like, called DTU data set. I think this is a really famous data set or a popular one used widely in the research community. Uh, and the way they build up this ground truth annotation is they rely on the LIDAR scanning, right? The laser scanning, really high end laser scanning. They, they set up the environment in, in a kind of a lab environment and they just scan the object from different viewpoints and then fuse the uh, point cloud eventually to have the, the, the final reconstruction. And that is the reference that you can use to, uh, evaluate your algorithms like the RGBD or, or RGB or multi-view reconstruction algorithm. So the problem of building the annotation in this way is that uh, despite like the high-end laser is usually really uh, precise, uh, it doesn't really cover the entire object. Like that's one problem, like because of the self-occlusion of the object, you can't really scan some part of it. So there's a missing surface in, in this kind of uh, annotation. The other problem is uh, artifact in the reconstruction, in the annotation. Because you still have some, like, for example, uh, for a certain type of property or surface property, it doesn't really reflect, you know, the, 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 the protein back, back to uh, the, the LIDAR. So it doesn't really read the depth reliably. And, and some other surface just doesn't really reflect. So you, you can't really scan it. Uh, and some other just have to wrong reading of the depth. So, so that's why you have some artifacts in, 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 the, in this reference, right? So, uh, in like doing or building up the annotation of ground truth in this way doesn't always give you 100% or, or exact annotation of the 3D reconstruction. Same. Yeah, right. Um, so, so basically what you're saying is you're proposing this data set because evaluating reconstructions is really difficult because 
other methods, they kind of have to use this sophisticated, very expensive scanners that have issues themselves, right? And what you're kind of, you came up with this kind of neat trick of using Lego bricks, right? To kind of overcome this need, right? Lego bricks, you know the model, right? You have an exact replica, an exact kind of CAD model that you can use to to compare to. Yeah. Um, and, and this way, you don't need this whole expensive kind of scanning setup. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like on on top of like the, I mean, not everybody can have can have the capacity to set up the really expensive uh, scanning device or scanning environment, right? Uh, so if a bunch of students just want to have some thing to evaluate their algorithms, then what do you do? Like if you don't have the the three D scanner, uh, so I think Lego or as I think I'm going to talk about later, Lego is just one example. But I think the key idea in this paper or the key contribution of this paper is really introduce a new paradigm to build a multi-view data set for object reconstruction, like how you can build reliable annotation uh, to, to, to do your, eva- uh, to do, to evaluate your 3D uh, reconstruction algorithm. But I do want to mention the other, the other type of uh, or the other type of uh, data set is using, of course, synthetic data set, right? So if you have the digital model of of something, the object of interest, you can always render some RGB images. And, and in that case, you have the really precise or the exact replica of the model, right? But then in that case, the RGB images are not real. So if you submit your paper using synthetic Images, you always have the reviewer to asking you, okay, does this generalize to real images? <laughs> and, you know, you, yeah. So if you have submitted any paper, you understand like reviewer two is a special guy that always <laughs> gives you some trick questions, right? Uh, yeah. So I think this is really like this, this data is a really good combination. Like you have the real images, but you also have the really reliable ground truth to evaluate against. Right. And I guess the, the point of this reviewer too, right? It's valid, right? Because when we're in this age of, you know, learning and all these kind of huge architectures that allow us to do amazing things, the big question is, well, how does it generalize, right? And if you train on synthetic data, well, that's nice, but most applications use real data. So how big is the domain gap, right? Um, and, yeah. and I think, yeah. And I think this work is, is really like right in the, in the, in the place to kind of bridge this gap, right? You, you have the, the ground truth and you have the real scans and you kind of, well, we're going to talk about it, but you're going to tell us how to kind of align between the two and find like a good way to evaluate reconstructions. Um, and also I think, you know, all of the methods that kind of try to push themselves, you know, as, as kind of multi-view or reconstruction based kind of methods, um, they always evaluate on something, right? And and it's kind of like, okay, we'll evaluate on what's easiest, right? Okay, so synthetic is easiest and it's not always the the right thing to evaluate. And and I think this really kind of fits that that gap. Um, yeah. Like in, but, in those a lot of nerve paper, right? You can see they use this uh, the nerve synthetic data set, like with the folder, I'm not sure if, if you have seen that one, like in those synthetic data set, you get really, really good novel synthesis results, right? But does it really translate well to real images? Like if you casually capture a, an image sequence and you throw it into Nerve, I bet it's not going to impress you or impress your friend who doesn't know a lot about computer vision, right? You just say, well, this AI sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's maybe that's one general answer. Uh, so yeah, so really, Evaluate your benchmark or evaluate, sorry, evaluate, evaluate your algorithm on realistic, uh, images. I think that is a really important, uh, topic for a lot of, uh, CV researcher to, to tackle. Right. Yeah. I completely agree. But, but now, okay. So if we kind of have to boil it down to a few bullet points. So what are the main contributions of this paper? The most important message we want to send out to the community through this paper is this new way of uh, building data set. Uh, you have the physical model and then you have the digital model and how you align them. 
So instead of using like 3D scanning or, or synthetic data set to, to have to, to build this data set, right? Uh, and I think, I think the other thing is to review how existing algorithms work in, in such a casual setup. Like, so if we evaluate a bunch of different, uh, algorithms, right? So it's RGBD or, or just RGB or like the, the backend algorithm, the backbone algorithm is different. Like it is it, range from traditional, you know, those co map style to, uh, more recently, those newer implicit representation, like nerve, news. And, and also we have some uh, like the depth only TSDF fusion, connect fusion, this kind of stuff. So yeah, if you look at the paper, you're going to see like some quite surprising to some people that even you have the depth sensor for this really precise RGB object reconstruction, sometimes the depth resolution is not great enough. It's not good enough to capture those details. So sometimes RGB actually is better than RGBD. So that's one interesting find we, we have uh, in, in this paper. All right, I can I can't wait to start talking about the details. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about related work. So, which papers does anybody need to read before they come and read your paper? Uh, I think for it depends on your on your background. I, I would like to say right. So, uh, if you are quite new to three D vision, I think it's not paper, but it's a software package you should use. It's called CodeMap. Like it's quite a popular uh, library people use to, to do uh, structure promotion or multiple stereo. And you can find great amount of resource uh, on how to use this stuff, uh, how to use this software. So by using it, you kind of understand the general pipeline or the traditional pipeline of building, like how to reconstruct the 3D from a bunch of 2D images, right? Uh, so there's a classic one. And then more recently, maybe you should read into a uh, nerve or, or news paper. It's called learning neural implicit surfaces by volume rendering for multi-view reconstruction. All right. All right. So I think this is really uh, a nice paper on top of nerve. So, uh, nerve, I, I think like everybody basically in the, in, in computer vision knows what it is at the moment. So it's, it's the neural implicit representation for, for the, for the 3D scene, so you can do a novel synthesis uh, after you train the nerve to represent the, the, some scene properties, for example, density and RGB of, of the scene. So news change the representation from density to SDF to really force the representation to capture the zero crossing surface to have a better geometry reconstruction. So I think that's one contribution of news. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the other data sets, I think like DTU, as I mentioned earlier, is a popular one people used to benchmark their 3D reconstruction. So we can have a read on that and then see how they're different, how our paper is different from their papers. Uh, and what else? I think like, for example, the other paper, the, the other data set from Meta called Common Objects in 3D, I think it take a really different direction. Uh, so they build a really large scale of data set, right? I think I can't remember the exact number of the, the number of video or number of objects on top of my head. Uh, I think let me just pull up the paper. So they have 19,000 models, whereas we only have more than 100. Like we, we sounds, we will really raise more, right? Compared to the common object in 3D. But the annotation level is different. So in their paper, the 3D object reconstruction, like the reconstruction or the ground truth or pseudo ground truth, what they call it, is actually reconstructed by code map. So it's not reliable enough to evaluate against, right? So if you want to evaluate your multiple reconstruction, of course, you want to be better than code map. So of course, you can't use code map as the reference. Uh, but I'm not saying like, Code 3D, like the data set is, is, is useless or anything. It's, it's just like, it's doing different stuff, right? It's doing more on objects understanding instead of precise 3D reconstruction evaluation. Right. So, okay. So if I have to kind of sum up the papers that you mentioned, so we have the 
uh, did you data set, the nerve paper, the newspaper, the call map package, and this uh, co 3D Common object in 3D? Yeah, and the co 3D data set from Meta, uh, all are relevant references, and I'll put them in the episode description so people can access them. All right, but let's let's talk about this paper now, okay? So tell us, what did you do here? All right. So yeah, when building this data set, I think the first step is buy some Lego bricks, right? Very important step. Because <laughs> <laughs> you need to build the Legos, right? So the first step is build some physical models. Uh, and then the like this, it, it doesn't really need any computer vision knowledge, right? As you can ask your 60 year old to, to do it. <laughs> they are capable of building Lego bricks. Uh, and then it actually, in our case, we have two sorts of, uh, data source for, uh, for our physical Lego models. The first one, as I just mentioned, we just build it ourselves. And then the other one is we actually, we are very lucky that we have a friend who is a huge Lego friend, a Lego fan. So he, he got, I think um, several or I don't know, more than 30 or 50 models, Lego models in, in his house. So we just borrow the models and, and do the scanning, uh, do the capturing, image capturing ourselves. So we don't actually need to physically like step by step to build those models. Uh, so that's really a key for us. So that's one, the first step, just build a physical one. And then the second one is build to build the digital replica of your physical model, right? So you can. That is kind of building the ground truth. Uh, so in this step, uh, cause Lego actually got a really huge fan base around the world. So we have a lot of software, uh, Lego software that you can use to build your, your Lego model using, you know, in the software is, is something like Blender. Uh, I think the exact name is called, uh, the, the, actually, we, we use a few of them. The first one is all called Mac, Macabric. It's a web-based uh, uh, application that you can just drag your mouse and you know build the models. Uh, and the good thing about this uh, website is that you, you can you, not only you can you know build a digital replica uh, one one step by one step, you can also import some existing Lego models. For example, we have some like. The friend I just mentioned, he got, uh, like those Lego models is identical. It's, it's the official Lego model set. So for those model sets, it's really complicated, but we don't actually need to build it because the, the cat model is available online. Right. So we just need to import it to this Macabric, uh, website and convert it into PLY file or OBJ file, or whatever mesh file you, you are happy with. Uh, to to have the the ground truth, yeah. So the first two steps is just building the models, and then the last one uh, is image capturing. So you pull up your iPhone. So in our case, we use iPhone, or you can use any Android phone actually to uh, you know just go around the object to scan it. Not really scan it, right? Just just casually capture this uh, this object. Go three three sixty around it. Uh, and then the last step is the image alignment. So I think this is the, uh, the critical step in, in, in this data set, right? So you have your image capture in one coordinate, and then you have your digital replica of the, the object in the other coordinate. So in, in this step, you need to align these two into the same coordinate so you, they, you can do evaluation. So in this step, what you do is, uh, in, cause we use, because we use, uh, iPhone, we have some initial, uh, camera posts provided by AR kit. So AR kit, like they, they can, they are able to do camera checking, but of course it's subject to camera drift and, and it's just not ideal. So we, uh, on top of this initial camera poses given by AR kit, we, uh, have some manual annotation, first of all. So that is the, it's just an interface is a GUI interface. We can uh, click on the mouse, you know, annotate a few 2D key points and also annotate a few 3D key points, like corresponding 3D key points. Then we can run PMP to have the first alignment to 
like to align the digital model to uh, the camera coordinate, right? So, and that is just the first step. And a second step is a multi-view consistent check. This is also a manual check. So what it does is it project the first align, first uh, the aligned uh, digital model to more views in the image sequence to see how aligned it is. And the, the user or the annotator have the option to uh, refine the camera poses, right? Uh, so in these two steps, you basically you have a really good alignment to from the digital model to uh, to the camera coordinate. However, it doesn't change the the AR kit poses, right? If it's cam if the camera is shift, then these two steps cannot rectify this error. So the last step we did is uh, to run a bundle adjustment on top of uh, these two steps to kind of rectify those uh, camera shift problem. Yeah, so that is how we build the data set. So the first step is build physical and build digital model. And then you capture your physical model using your iPhone or using an, an, any smartphone or just other any video recording devices you have. And the last step is to align the digital model to your image sequence uh, coordinate. Yeah, that, that was and a great recap. Let me see that I, I follow. Okay. So the first thing you do, you assemble the um, Lego model, right? You you go to the store. Well, you, you didn't go to the store because you had that friend. But you go to the store, you buy a, a, a Lego pack, right, of, I don't know, Harry Potter's uh, Hogwarts Castle. You put it, yeah, exactly. you start assembling yeah. it, right? Now you have the physical model sitting on your table. Then... Since there's a huge fan base, you have like the actual CAD model provided by Lego. So that's the official model. It's one to one match to what you just assembled that's sitting on your desk. So now you have something sitting on your desk and something sitting inside your computer and, and they kind of match exactly to each other. But now the next step would be to scan the physical one, right? So when I say scan, it's not really scan, right? It's take your phone, you kind of go around the model, right? You, you get like a multi-view, multiple views from different angles. And now you have this short sequence of images of this model. And then the big challenge is, well, now you have the video, how do you align it to that 3D model that's sitting in your computer? And this is where you have a lot of kind of uh, very detailed operation and kind of human in the loop um, kind of annotation uh, scheme, right? Where you, you kind of, you get the key points, you get this initial alignment using a PNP, right? The key points are, are human generated. Uh, then you kind of project it, you allow to, to kind of correct it, right? Uh, if, if it's not uh, too good. And, and this is like a, a huge effort, right? I think, I think m probably most of the work was, was done here, right? So how to get this good alignment uh, in such a way that there is an actual physical to digital as close as possible yeah. to one hundred percent match. Yeah. So it's it's also a quite interesting development there. Right? So initially, we need to spend I don't know five minutes per sequence, you know, to align one digital model to one image sequence. But as we go on, we can refine this process. Like we know how to speed things up. And we also change the interface to more user-friendly. And it's easier to annotate. And yeah, so we actually learn a lot like how to annotate data efficiently along the way. And I think that's quite interesting. It's, it's quite different from like the traditional research paper where you develop a method. This is not about like developing a novel method or or have some smart tricks to improve, to get both number in the table, but it's kind of an engineering and, and fun process, right? Because at the end, it's, it's building that goal. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I guess like the main question is when, and I saw it like in the paper, you have that in the results section. So maybe that's a good bridge to start talking about that. So how do you know how good you're aligning, right? What's the accuracy, right? Because even when they manufacture the Lego bricks, there's some level of inaccuracy, right? Some tolerance between every brick, right? They look identical to us, 
But me as a, mecha- as a former mechanical engineer, I know that no two pieces are exactly identical, right? There's some tolerance. Yeah. So, so how, yeah. like, how good is this alignment process? And uh, like, how, like, I guess what I'm asking is, what is the baseline error that you're working with, right? Yeah, so uh, to evaluate the quality of our annotation, we basically need to measure two things. The first one is geometry, right? How, like, is, is the digital replica really 100% to the physical one? So that's geometry evaluation. The second one is the alignment evaluation, right? How good our alignment algorithm can, you know, shift or transform the digital model to the camera coordinate. So in terms of the first one, we borrow a micrometer from the department. So I think the accuracy of that is 10 micrometer, if I remember correctly on top of my head. Uh, So we just measure if we stack up a few Lego bricks, we measure like the deviant from the design or, or the digital spec. And so that's how we select the, the threshold in our table. So we use two thresholds when we evaluate the, uh, or like the, the baseline algorithms, right? So we select the first one, the, the, the most strict one uh, is 2.5 millimeter and the, and the more relaxed one is five millimeters. So we select these two based on our, uh, after we evaluate our, uh, annotation quality. For example, if our evaluation quality is like the, the error threshold is if we set it to one micrometer, then it doesn't really reflect anything, right? It, it doesn't re- really reflect the quality of the, or, or reflect how good the reconstruction algorithm is because it's with, within the, the, the Lego brick error. So you, you can't really tell whether this like one micrometer error is from the Lego brick itself or from the reconstruction algorithm. Right. Actually, and I have to say 10, 10 micrometers, like, I don't know, most listeners are probably don't have like an ocean, but 10 micrometer, that's pretty accurate, right? Like this is not something that it's noticeable by the naked eye, right? This is something that's very, very small. But yes, yeah, it is, it's pretty precise, I would say. Because uh, the the error source for geometry will be basically the manufacturer error and how hard you press the the Lego bricks, right? So if if you stack a few Lego bricks, if you don't press it hard enough, then you have some gaps between uh, the bricks. Right. So that would be different from the digital replica because in the digital replica, it assumes these Lego bricks are tightly coupled together. So basically, two error two error source. Right, so uh, one manufacturing so error and one like kind of an assembly error, right? Yes, exactly. And yeah, so then for the alignment evaluation, we just, uh, we run some, so we basically what we did is we have a calibration board uh, lay on the floor and we capture uh, some calibration sequence. So we place a Lego model in the middle of the calibration board and we capture the sequence, we run our alignment algorithm and compare that against uh, to the calibration result. Right. So that's how we can know like how good our because we, we have you have no way to tell uh, the exact ground truth of the alignment, right? Because you don't have the thing. So we have to assume the collaboration collaboration result is the uh, is the ground truth, is the pseudo ground truth. So we just compare against our, uh, we compare our alignment algorithm against that one. So now you have like this good notion of how accurate your your data set and alignment and the manufacturing error and the assembly error, right? So now you know like what's the range of of, of accuracy and the numbers are in the paper. I don't think they're, they're too important right now. Um, but okay, so what are the benchmarks that, that once you've got all of this figured out, what are the benchmarks that, that you ran? Like how, which methods did you evaluate and what are the evaluation metrics that you used? Yeah, so we, we run several methods, but I think they, are, they can be categorized to three major types. The first one is the volume fusion type. Right? If, 
based on Connect Fusion, like doing TSF Fusion uh, using DAP command. So uh, the DAP apps actually come from the LiDAR, uh, LiDAR sensor of the iPhone iPhone 13. So it's, it's not really high resolution that uh, that map is, is, is getting out of it. Uh, and then the second type of algorithm is the traditional uh, multi-view stereo reconstruction. One representative is CodeMap, the widely popular software people use to, to do a 3D reconstruction. Uh, and, and then the third type, sorry, it should be four categories. The third type is uh, the neural network-based multi-view stereo. So MBS net, you know, based on the cost volume, you, like, you, you extract image feature from your input views, and then you, uh, you do homography wrapping and you have the cost volume, then you know, you, you, that's how you get the, the depth uh, out of the multi-view images. And then the last uh, type of methods we evaluate uh, on our data set is uh, the most recent uh, neural implicit based method. We use NERV and NEWS, those two papers I just mentioned. And I think some interesting result out of this evaluation is that uh, we found out those neural implicit based representation, those NERV and NEWS really stand out from it. Like before we run our algorithm, we always have, we all kind of skeptical that does the NEWS or NERV really outperform cold map? Because Maybe the author really, you know, is it really generalized, right? Code map, it has been, it has proven that like it can work in most of the cases, but does news or, or nerve can generalize well to, to those casually captured scenes. So it turns out that it, it does like news really, it, it, it just is, yeah, it's doing great, uh, compared to co to co map or other, or other algorithms. And then the second interesting finding we have is uh, for the method that use uh, depth sensor. So if you, uh, we always we always have this bias that okay, you if you have the depth sensor, you should use it, right? Because it just gives you quite reliable depth reading. You don't need to do like you don't need to recover the depth from multiple multiple images. However, for for this uh, detailed object reconstruction, the depth sensor from mobile devices are not high resolution enough. Like iPhone is great if you want to scan your entire room, right? Because maybe you don't really care about like some object details. Your focus is really getting the entire geometry uh, of the room. So yeah, it depends on like application, right? So if you still like, if you want to go for like scene level reconstruction, iPhone like that sensor from mobile devices, they are great. Uh, it's, it's more efficient, right? So you don't need to run those multi-view reconstruction algorithm, you just run volume fusion to, to get uh, your, your 3D reconstruction. But uh, for these you know, tidy objects, like this desk, desktop environment, like for, for objects that are maybe you can sit on top of the desk, maybe you should consider uh, RGB images because usually what we have is we have high resolution RGB images, right? We can easily get 4K images from our mobile phone, but we are still a bit far away from getting 4K depth maps from our mobile phone. Yeah, I think like these are very, like two very interesting finds, right? Like the first one you talked about that Nerf and Noose, they're kind of really performing really, really well because it's sometimes hard to kind of distinguish between the hype and reality, right? Like every paper is going to show you the bold numbers and, and obviously they're doing good scientific work, but the, the question of generality always kind of, kind of remains. And here you have this kind of independent, data set and benchmark that kind of says, well, let's see how this works in real life. And, and it turns out that these two methods kind of really shine. And I think this is a really valuable find for, for both the academic community, but also for industry, right? Probably a lot of companies, people listening to the podcast saying, well, should we start integrating NERFs or NUS into our pipelines? And, and we're not sure that it's really going to work because we only see it, saw it on synthetic. And here you can see that it actually can, can work in reality. And the second find that you talked about, like the the low resolution nerf integration into the pipeline, and me as a point cloud cloud 
person, like for me, yeah, always use the depth. Depth is amazing. 3D is amazing. But in this particular case, it's, it's not always valuable, right? Because here you have like very fine detail that you want to capture, but your depth map is very low resolution and it's not, and it, it will probably give you kind of wrong signals, right? The wrong information or very coarse yeah, information exactly. that they already exist in the RGB um, high resolution image. So, so just use that. And I think this is a really valuable find. Okay, so we talked about the baselines and the interesting finds. So, so let's just kind of now talk about the data set, right? What does it contain, right? Give me the, the numbers and the subdivision. Um, what is yeah. this data set? So the data set we got at the end, we have 153 LEGO models in the data set. Uh, so each one of the each one of these model you have an image sequence uh, for it, and I think the average number of images in one sequence is sixty or eighty frames in one sequence. Uh, so yeah, that's just kind of the scale of this uh, data set. And within the data set, we have two categories of uh, Lego models. The first one is the human curated uh, Lego models, those official models that we borrow from our friend. Uh, so those are really, really nice Lego model, like Ferrari, like you have the replica of some Ferrari and Porsche 911 or, or the Big Bang building in, in the UK. Uh, yeah, so those fancy models. And then we have a, also, a, we have a large amount of random model sets. So in this random model set, it just uh, so these Lego models, they are not really meaningful. You, this is not some like really uh, good looking models. They just randomly pick from our our blog repository to to build it. So yeah, but it, I mean, it's it's about diversity, right? So you don't want, always want to have some nice model. You want to have some, you know. Well, if you, we have some, just some random shape, does it really do well on, on random shape? And, and the other purpose of building this large amount of Lego bricks is, uh, this random set is if you want to train your deep network, then you can train on this random set and then test on those, uh, evaluation sets. So that's the idea there. All right. Yeah. So, so you have the, the real world set, which is like exact models from from lego right stuff that look like things from the real world or from a cinematic universe or yeah. something like that and then the random set you procedurally generate random blocks kind of connected to each other and then you build it in the real world and and that's just about generality right you want to see that algorithm yeah. general um so just let me ask you does the the video recording also contain the depth maps Oh, yes. So the video recording, we have, of course, the RGB images and also the depth maps from the, the Apple LiDAR sensor and, and also, of course, the camera parameters, including extrinsic and intrinsic. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So everything you need to kind of do the reconstructions and, and use for supervision for, for NERF and use. Um, yeah, that's correct. And all those kind of methods. Okay. So I think we covered all of the kind of important stuff, but let me talk about conclusions, kind of future work. So how do you see the impact of this paper going forward? And have there been any interesting papers that followed it? To yeah. me, it is quite interesting paper, right? Cause it introduced a new way to build a data set. I think it's quite fun. The no, it, it enable basically everyone, you can build your 3D uh, evaluation data set. You don't have to rely on those uh, 3D scanner and it is not a compromise as well, right? So we show like it, it can do as great as those, uh, very expensive scanner. Uh, so, and then in terms of the interesting follow up work, cause this is still not published yet. Uh, it, it is going to be, uh, appear at CVPR 23. So I'm not sure if anyone has uh, used this data set yet. I hope people will pick up the data set soon, but let's see. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too. I mean, to me, one of the reasons that I, I like I wanted to have this data set in, in the podcast is I think this is like a 
one of those papers that is going to be like a great benchmark, like every method that's going to say, oh, we beat Nerf. Like, I think they should try this benchmark because it's like, this is the real world, right? It's going to to tell you not in the synthetic world where everything's nice and and tight and no problems and no no issues, right? This is going to kind of give you a notion of how well this method is going to work in, the re, in real life. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of value in that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so now we'll move on to my favorite part of the podcast. What did reviewer two say? Please share some insightful comments you got from the mm-hmm. review process. Uh, yeah. I feel like the review process for this paper is quite, quite good to be honest for, for us. Right, so we didn't have any hilarious question from the reviewer too, but I think he actually raised a few like valid concern that we thought we might do the, we might extend the data set anyway as well. So th- I think one of the biggest concern is about the texture on, on, on the models, which as, as you can imagine, like Lego model is you have the plastic kind of texture, uh, it's quite, it, it doesn't really reflect how real world object would look, right? So we have very really diverse of uh, texture on, on real world objects. Uh, I think one way to tackle this problem is really you can buy the paint material, right? You can paint your Lego models and you give it different texture. It can be matte and it could be like really uh, specular, you know, it, you can change it, right? So you just randomly apply some, some paint on top of it. That'd be great. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is kind of linked to uh, the future extension of the data set. So as I mentioned from at the very beginning of this podcast, this is not limited to the Lego, right? So the idea of building a physical one and building a digital one, and then you align them to build the data set, it can apply to uh, a lot of stuff. Like for example, the one come immediately on top of my head is the 3D printed object. But if you have some something you want to reconstruct, you want to evaluate against, you just download the digital model, you can model, you have a 3D printer. Now 3D printing is not very expensive. Like you buy a 3D printer or asking your supervisor to buy for you. Uh, and yeah, you just print it and you capture an image sequence of it. And now you have the precise uh, ground truth for it. Or you can it, you can easily extend this kind of idea to not just Lego to 3D printed object, and then for 3D printed object, you can easily apply multiple texture as well. So yeah, I think yeah. this is really like the future work, or if people can want to extend on on top of this Lego data set. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I mean, I have a lot of works working with IKEA assembly. Um, uh, yeah. IKEA assemblies, yeah, right? Assembly so, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so even when you assemble a furniture, right, you have a CAD model. That you, well, theoretically, you can get or kind of reverse engineer a CAD model of the data set. I know that IKEA recently released a few a few data sets for the research community to use. Uh, but yeah, you assemble the furniture in your home. You you kind of take a you can take a, a video of that and, and evaluate the reconstruction on that and there you can have different textures right because ikea furniture sometimes come in different colors different textures uh, so you can also apply to that that's a really interesting direction right it kind of moves moves from your your tabletop to your right to your room right this is much larger items and and it's interesting i think um to see how well these, this kind of generalizes to even that, right? You know, is it like a, um, is it size dependent? Probably not, but but I don't know. Nobody evaluated, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be great. Like if you can have some IKEA furniture, like you have the exact model for that. I think back in the days, there's one paper called uh, Pex 3D. They, they sort of like, have this idea, like they, they go to the Ikea store to capture the chairs, the tables, and they go to the Ikea website to download the cat model. I, well, I don't know where they find the cat model and then they just do the alignment. But in that, in that data set is a single uh, image data set. So it only annotate one single image to one cat model. So it doesn't really do uh, the multi-view reconstruction stuff. 
Right. Yeah. But maybe, yeah. We yeah. Can, uh, yeah. Interesting future stuff, works. Uh, for IKEA, yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. So, Keji, thank you very much for being a part of the podcast. And until next time, let your papers do the talking. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Bye. See you. Are you interested in 3D and AI? If so, the team at Yum is interested to hear from you. Yum is an Israeli startup dedicated to volumetric video creation. They were voted as the 2022 best startup to work for by the Duns 100. Join their team that works on geometric deep learning research, implicit representations of 3D humans, nerfs, and 3D 4D generative models. Visit yum.com. Thank you for listening. That's it for this episode of Talking Papers. Please subscribe to the podcast feed on your favorite podcast app. All links are available in this episode description and on the Talking Papers website. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast, sponsor it, or just share your thoughts with us, feel free to email talking.papers.podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to tune in every week for the latest episodes. And until then, let your papers do the talking. <laughs>